In my previous video, I talked about runtime interfaces, a way to have dynamic dispatch using an any opaque pointer and a function pointer. However, we rarely need dynamic dispatch. Instead, we can use static dispatch or other techniques. So today I want to talk about different ways to write polymorphic code. The first and easiest way to define a polymorphic function is to use any type. By defining a parameter with any type, your function can take anything. Now you can write code like it's JavaScript or Python. No types, no problems, right? The main issue when using any type is that we lose the benefits of having types. The most problematic being that you need to read the source code to know what the function actually wants. In this example, we need to pass an object with two methods. If one of them is missing, we'll get a compile error, which I guess is not that bad, but it's not ideal. To make it clearer, we can specify the functions we need by adding them as parameters. Now we know that our type must implement two functions. To use this function, we first define a type that meets the requirements then create an object and pass it to the function with the function bodies. Now, if we need an object with a lot of functions, it can quickly become difficult to read. An option is to define a generic type to store all of these function bodies and use it as a parameter to our polymorphic function. The way this works isn't necessarily straightforward, so let me break it down for you. In Zig, you define a generic data structure by creating a function that takes a type as a parameter and returns another type which is an anonymous struct. So when we call this function, we get a new type. That's what we do in polymorphic FN. When we define the parameter FNS, the type of FNS is whatever the something FN bodies function returns when we give it the type of our something argument. And we can do this because Zig accepts any expression that returns a type at a type position. I mean, take a look at this code sample I found in a blog post. This function's return type is an if-else expression, and it's perfectly fine. All right, so if you take a look at this generic type function, the structure is like an interface. It describes the functions that your concrete types must implement. Okay, so can we do better than this? I would argue that this is good enough, but I want to show you the Zimple library that goes one step further. All right, so if we take a look at the Zimple documentation, we see a very similar situation to the one we just described. We got this function that returns a generic type, which defines an interface with like three functions. Then we have this poll function that takes two parameters, our any type parameter, and then the interface. But the author doesn't like that we actually need to do this. So the Zimple library provides the function imp, that infers the default value for each member of our like generic type. If we use this imp function, the call to the poll function is much simpler. Okay, so let's actually look at what's happening. So we now have this poll function, we still have this any type parameter, but now the interface is like this function. So this function is going to return a type. Let's actually take a look at uh, what this imp function is. So it takes two parameters. One is the interface, and this is the actual type. And so what this function does is it create a copy of the fields of the interface. It takes all the field of the interface, and then it sets a default value to them by taking the actual concrete value of the type we give it. And then it returns this new type which is like our interface with the values of the concrete type. And so as a result, now when you call this poll function, this poll function will know that it needs to actually use the concrete functions of this argument. Anyway, patterns like this that use any type are often referred to as interfaces or comp time interfaces. In his talk on the Zig Showtime, Michel Hashimoto also talked about comptime interfaces. But it's actually different from what we just saw. He defined it as a value with an implementation that changes depending on some compiled time known information. The idea is to define the same type multiple times, and then at compile time, choosing the implementation to use depending on some comptime known information. So not really what we were doing with any type. 
Also, something to be careful when using any type is to make sure that using generics wouldn't be a better option. For example, if you are trying to compare two variables, making a generic function is probably better since we most likely want to compare two variables of the same type. All right, let's move on. Another way to define polymorphic code is to use tagged unions. As a reminder, a bare union defines a set of possible types that a value can be. That allows us to store different types in a single container. The problem with bare unions is that we can't use switch. If we try, we get an error and that's a problem because switch is extremely useful and powerful. So that's why we need to use a tagged union. Now, each field has a tag and can be used with a switch. For example, if I have this shape tagged union, I can define the function surround to surround the shapes with the rectangle. Inside this function, I first start by defining a rectangle variable, then I need to switch over the different possible types to calculate the position and size of the surrounding rectangle before drawing it. Now, if all the types share the same method, for example, if all the shapes have a draw method, then we can define a draw function that takes a shape as a parameter, and then we can use a switch with the inline else prong to capture the value and call the draw method. Using inline else, the compiler will generate the prongs body for each possible value. Note that you can do a combination of the two. For example, if you need to do something special with triangles, we can first check the triangle case and then use the inline else. As an alternative, when using an inline prong on a union, we have access to an additional capture to obtain the union's enum tag value. Unlike with any type where the compiler will create a function for each type, with a tagged union, we are going to have only one function and the switch isn't free. So we'll have to pay a small runtime cost. All right, that's it. That's the video. Now, bonus time. I've seen a few things I want to share with you, so let me know what you think. First, if you need to store some extra information that is common to all types, one possible way is to create a struct, add fields in it to store the extra information, and define the tag union as a field inside this struct. Then it's the same idea, but the union is in a field. So that's an idea. I'm not sure it's a good one though, because you don't really want to extract information out of your types. Like in this example, all the shapes have an X and Y position. And if you extract it out of them to put it inside this shape struct, then all of your types become pretty much unusable by themselves. The last thing I want to talk about is this Reddit post that I found. In short, the author describes a way to automatically generate the tag union from a list of implementations. Interesting post, you can check it out if you want. All right, all right, all right. Subscribe. Holy shit, man, this show, what a show, man. Holy shit, man. I had to record this shit like four times because it's keep fucking buggy shit. You know, I know a lot of types. I know the best types. I love types, but sometimes I can't pretend they don't exist. You know, I know a lot of types. I know the best types. I love types, but sometimes we can pretend they don't exist. I mean, come on, man, this is fine. No, you can't do this, it's illegal. You need to use types, otherwise it's not readable code. No, let me use AI to do this for you. Now this code is really unreadable, but at least we have types. When you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Even your m